Morning and Evening Thoughts by James Allen First Morning In aiming at the life of blessedness, one of the simplest beginnings to be considered and rightly made, is that which we all make every day namely, the beginning of each day's life. There is a sense in which every day may be regarded as the beginning of a new life, in which one can think, act, and live newly, and in a wiser and better spirit. The right beginning of the day will be followed by a cheerfulness permeating the household with a sunny influence, and the tasks and duties of the day will be undertaken in a strong and confident spirit, and the whole day will be well lived. First evening. There can be no progress, no achievement. Without sacrifice, and a man's worldly success will be in the measure that he sacrifices his confused animal thoughts and fixes his mind on the development of his plans and the strengthening of his resolution and self-reliance. And the higher he lifts his thoughts, the more manly, upright, and righteous he becomes, the greater will be his success. The more blessed and enduring will be his achievements. Second morning. None but right acts can follow right thoughts, none but a right life can follow right acts, and by living a right life all blessedness is achieved. Mind is the master power that molds and makes and man is mind, and evermore he takes the tool of thought, and, shaping what he wills, brings forth a thousand joys, a thousand ills. He thinks in secret, and it comes to pass. Environment is but his looking glass. Second evening. Calmness of mind is one of the beautiful jewels of wisdom. A man becomes calm in the measure that he understands himself as a thought-evolved being, and he as he develops a right understanding, and sees more and more clearly the internal relations of things by the action of cause and effect, he ceases to fret and fume, and worry and grieve, and remains poised, steadfast, serene. Third morning to follow, under all circumstances, the highest promptings within you, to be always true to the divine self, to rely upon the inward voice, the inward light, and to pursue your purpose with a fearless and restful heart, believing that the future will yield unto you the need of every thought and effort, knowing that the laws of the universe can never fail and that your own will come back to you with mathematical exactitude this is faith and the living of faith. Third evening. Have a thorough understanding of your work, and let it be your own, and as you proceed, ever following the inward guide, the infallible voice, you will pass on from victory to victory, and will rise step by step to higher resting places, and your ever broadening outlook will gradually reveal to you the essential beauty and purpose of life. Self-purified, health will be yours. Self-governed, power will be yours, and all that you do will prosper. And I may stand where health, success, and power await my coming, if, each fleeting hour, I cling to love and patience, and abide with stainlessness, and never step aside. From high integrity, so shall I see. At last the land of immortality. Fourth morning. When the tongue is well controlled and wisely subdued, when selfish impulses and unworthy thoughts no longer rush to the tongue demanding utterance, when the Speech has become harmless, pure, gracious, gentle, and purposeful, and no 
word is uttered but in sincerity and truth then are the five steps in virtuous speech accomplished, then is the second great lesson in truth learned and mastered. Make pure thy heart, and thou wilt make thy life rich, sweet and beautiful. Fourth evening. Having clothed himself with humility. The first questions a man asks himself. Ah. How am I acting towards others? What am I doing to others? How am I thinking of others? Are my thoughts of, and acts towards? Others prompted by unselfish love. As a man, in the silence of his soul. Asks himself these searching questions, he. Will unerringly see where he has hitherto. Failed. Fifth morning. To dwell in love always and towards all. Is to live the true life, is to have life itself. Knowing this, the good man gives up. Himself unreservedly to the spirit of love. And dwells in love towards all, contending. With none, condemning none, but loving. All. The Christ spirit of love puts an end, not only to all sin, but to all division and contention. Fifth evening. When sin and self are abandoned, the heart is restored to its imperishable joy. Joy comes and fills the self-emptied heart, it abides with the peaceful, its reign is with the pure. Joy flees from the selfish, it deserts the Quarrelsome, it is hidden from the impure. Joy cannot remain with the selfish, it is wedded to love. Sixth morning. In the pure heart there is no room left. Where personal judgments and hatreds can find lodgment, for it is filled to overflowing. With tenderness and love, it sees no evil. And only as men succeed in seeing no evil. In others will they become free from sin, and sorrow, and suffering. If men only understood, that the heart that sins must sorrow, that the hateful mind tomorrow, reaps its barren harvest, weeping, starving, resting not, nor sleeping. Tenderness would fill their being. They would see with pity seeing. If they only understood. Sixth evening. To stand face to face with truth, to arrive. After innumerable wanderings and pains, at. Wisdom and bliss, not to be finally defeated. And cast out, but to ultimately triumph. Over every inward foe such is man's divine. Destiny, such is glorious goal, and this. Every saint, sage, and saviour has declared. A man only begins to be a man. When he ceases to whine and revile, and commences to search for the hidden justice which regulates his life, and as he adapts his mind to that regulating factor, he ceases to accuse others as the cause of his condition, and builds himself up in strong and noble thoughts, ceases to kick against circumstances, but begins to use them as aids to his more rapid progress, and as a means of discovering the hidden power and possibilities within himself. Seventh morning. The will to evil and the will to good are both within thee, which wilt thou employ? Thou knowest what is right and what is wrong. Which wilt thou love and foster? Which destroy? Thou art the chooser of thy thoughts and deeds. Thou art the maker of thine inward state. The power is thine to be what thou wilt be. Thou buildest truth and love, all lies and hate. Seventh evening. The teaching of Jesus brings men back to the simple truth that righteousness or right doing is entirely a matter of individual conduct and not a mystical, something apart from a man's thoughts and deeds. Calmness and patience can become 
habitual by first grasping, through effort. A calm and patient thought, and then continuously thinking it, and living in it. Until use becomes second nature, and anger and impatience pass away forever. Eighth morning. Man is made or unmade by himself, in the armory of thought he forges the weapons by which he destroys himself, he also fashions the tools with which he builds for himself heavenly mansions of joy and strength and peace by the right choice and true application of thought man ascends to the divine perfection by the abuse and wrong application of thought. He descends below the level of the beast. Between these two extremes are all the grades of character, and man is there. Maker and master. As a being of power, intelligence, and love, and the lord of his own thoughts. Man holds the key to every situation. Eighth evening. Whatsoever you harbor in the inmost chambers of your heart will, sooner or later, by the inevitable law of reaction, shape itself in your outward life. Every soul attracts its own, and nothing can possibly come to it that does not belong to it. To realize this is to recognize the universality of divine law. If thou wouldest he right the world and banish all its evils and its woes, Make its wild places bloom, and its drear deserts blossom as the rose. Then write thyself. Ninth morning. Whatever conditions are rendering your life burdensome, you may pass out of and beyond them by developing and utilizing within you the transforming power of self purification and self conquest. Before the divine radiance of a pure Heart all darkness vanishes and all clouds melt away, and he who has conquered self has conquered the universe. He who sets his foot firmly upon the path of self-conquest, who walks aided by the staff of faith, the highway of self-sacrifice, will assuredly achieve the highest prosperity, and will reap abounding and enduring joy and bliss. Ninth evening. It is the silent and conquering thought. Forces which bring all things into manifestation. The universe grew out of thought. To adjust all your thoughts to a perfect and unswerving faith in the omnipotence and supremacy of good is to cooperate with that good and to realize within yourself the solution and destruction of all evil. To mentally deny evil is not sufficient. It must, by daily practice, be risen above and understood. To affirm the good mentally is inadequate, it must, by unswerving endeavor, be entered into and comprehended. Tenth morning. Every thought you think is a force sent out. Whatever your position in life may B. Before you can hope to enter into any measure of success, usefulness, and power, you must learn how to focus your thought forces by cultivating calmness and repose. There is no difficulty, however great, but will yield before a calm and purposeful concentration of thought, and no legitimate object but may be speedily actualized by the intelligent use and direction of one's soul forces. Think good thoughts, and they will quickly become actualized in your outward life in the form of good conditions. Tenth evening. That which you would be and hope to be. You may be now. Non-accomplishment. Resides in your perpetual postponement. And, having the power to postpone, you also have the power to accomplish to perpetually accomplish, realize this truth. And you shall be today, and every day, the ideal being of whom you dreamed. 
say to yourself, I will live in my ideal. Now, I will manifest my ideal now, I will. Be my ideal now, and all that tempts me. Away from my ideal I will not listen to. I will listen only to the voice of my ideal. Eleventh morning. Be as a flower, content to be, to grow. In sweetness day by day. If thou wouldest he perfect thyself in. Knowledge, perfect thyself in love. If thou wouldest he reach the highest. Ceaselessly cultivate a loving and compassionate heart to him who chooses goodness. Sacrificing all is given that which is more than and includes all. Eleventh evening. The great law never cheats any man of his just due. Human life, when rightly lived, is simple with a beautiful simplicity. He who comprehends the utter Simplicity of life, who obeys its laws, and does not step aside into the dark paths and complex mazes of selfish desire, stands where no harm can reach him. Then there is fullness of joy, abounding plenty, and rich and complete blessedness. Twelfth morning. Every man reaps the results of his own thoughts and deeds, and suffers for his own wrong. He who begins right, and continues right, does not need to desire, and search for felicitous results, they are already at hand, they follow as consequences, they are the certainties, the realities, of life. Sweet is the rest and deep is the bliss of him who has freed his heart from its lusts and hatreds and dark desires. Twelfth evening. You are the creator of your own shadows. You desire, and then you grieve, renounce. And then you shall rejoice. Of all the beautiful truths pertaining. To the soul, none is more gladdening. Or fruitful of divine promise and confidence. Than this that man is the master of. Thought, the molder of character, and. The maker and shaper of character environment, and destiny. Thirteenth morning. As darkness is a passing shadow, and light is a substance that remains, so sorrow is fleeting, but joy abides forever. No true thing can pass away and become lost, no false thing can remain and be preserved. Sorrow is false, and it cannot live, joy is true and it cannot die. Joy may become hidden for a time, but it can always be recovered, sorrow may remain for a period, but it can be transcended and dispersed. Do not think your sorrow will remain. It will pass away like a cloud. Do not believe that the torments of sin are ever your portion, they will vanish like a hideous nightmare. Awake. Arise. Be holy. And joyful. Thirteenth evening. Tribulation lasts only so long as there. Remains some chaff of self which needs to. Be removed. The tribulum, or threshing. Machine, ceases to work when all the. Grain is separated from the chaff. And when the last impurities are blown away from the soul. Tribulation has completed its work. And there is no more need for it. Then abiding joy is realized. The sole and supreme use of suffering is to purify, to burn out all that is useless and impure. Suffering ceases for him. Who is pure? There could be no object in burning gold after the dross had been removed. Fourteenth morning. In speaking of self-control, one is easily misunderstood. It should not be associated with a destructive repression, but with a constructive expression. A man is happy, wise, and great in the measure that he controls himself, he is 
wretched, foolish, and mean in the measure that he allows his animal nature to dominate his thoughts and actions. He who controls himself, controls his life, his circumstances, his destiny, and wherever he goes he carries his happiness with him as an abiding possession. Renunciation precedes regeneration. The permanent happiness which men seek in dissipation, excitement, and abandonment to unworthy pleasures is found only in the life which reverses. All this the life of self-control. Fourteenth evening. Law, not confusion, is the dominating principle in the universe, justice, not injustice is the soul and substance of life. And righteousness, not corruption, is the molding and moving force in the spiritual government of the world. This being so, man has but the right himself to find that the universe is right. When I am pure, I shall have solved the mystery of life. I shall be sure. When I am free from hatred, lust and strife, I am in truth, and truth abides in me. I shall be safe, and sane, and wholly free. When I am pure. Fifteenth morning. If men only understood. That their hatred and resentment. Slays their peace and sweet contentment. Hurts themselves, helps not another. Does not cheer one lonely brother. They would seek the better doing. Of good deeds which leaves no ruin. If they only understood. If men only understood. How love conquers, how prevailing. Is its might, grim hate assailing. How compassion endeth sorrow. Maketh wise, and doth not borrow. Pain of passion, they would ever. Live in love, in hatred never. If they only understood. Fifteenth evening. The grace and beauty that were in Jesus. Can be of no value to you cannot be. Understood by you unless they are also. In you, and they can never be in you, until. You practice them, for, apart from doing. The qualities which constitute goodness. Do not, as far as you are concerned, exist. To adore Jesus for his good qualities is a long step towards truth, but to practice those qualities is truth itself, and he who fully adores the perfection of another will not rest content in his own imperfection, but will fashion his soul after the likeness of that other. Therefore thou who adorest Jesus for his divine qualities, practice those qualities thyself, and thou too shalt be divine. Sixteenth morning. Let a man realize that life in its totality proceeds from the mind, and lo, the way of blessedness is opened up to him. For he will then discover that he possesses the power to rule his mind and to fashion it in accordance with his ideal so will he elect to strongly instead. Fastly walk those pathways of thought and action which are altogether excellent, to him life will become beautiful and sacred. And, sooner or later, he will put to flight all evil, confusion, and suffering, for it is impossible for a man to fall short of liberation, enlightenment, and peace who guards with unwearying diligence the gateway of his heart. Sixteenth evening. By constantly overcoming self, a man gains a knowledge of the subtle intricacies of his mind, and it is this divine knowledge which enables him to become established in calmness. Without self-knowledge there can be no abiding peace of mind, and those who are carried away by tempestuous passions, cannot approach the holy place where calmness reigns. The weak man is like one who, having mounted a fiery steed, allows it to run 
away with him, and carry him whithersoever. It wills, the strong man is like one who, having mounted the steed, governs it, with a masterly hand and makes it go in, whatever direction and at whatever speed. He commands. Seventeenth morning. There is no strife, no selfishness, in the kingdom, there is perfect harmony, equipoise, and rest. Those who live in the kingdom of love have all their needs supplied by the law of love. A self is the root cause of all strife and suffering, so love is the root cause of all peace and bliss. Those who are at rest in the kingdom do not look for happiness in any outward possessions. They are freed from all anxiety and trouble and, resting in love, they are the embodiment of happiness. Seventeenth evening. Let it not be supposed that the children of the kingdom live in ease and indolence. These two sins are the first that have to be eradicated when the search for the kingdom is entered upon, they live in a peaceful activity, in fact, they only truly live, for the life of self, with its train of worries, griefs, and fears, is not real life. The children of the kingdom are known by their life, they manifest the fruits of the spirit dash love, joy, peace, long suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, meekness, temperance, self control. Under all circumstances and vicissitude. Eighteenth morning. The gospel of Jesus is a gospel of living and doing. If it were not this, it would not voice the eternal truth. Its temple is purified. Conduct, the entrance door to which is self surrender. It invites men to shake off sin and promises, as a result, joy and Blessedness and perfect peace. The kingdom of heaven is perfect. Trust, perfect knowledge, perfect peace. No sin can enter therein, no self born. Thought or deed can pass its golden gates. No impure desire can defile its radiant robes. All may enter it who will, but all must pay the price their unconditional abandonment of self. Eighteenth evening. I say this and know it to be truth that circumstances can only affect you in so far as you allow them to do so. You are swayed by circumstances because you have not a right understanding of the nature, use, and power of thought. You believe, and upon this little word belief hang all our joys and sorrows, that outward things have the power to make or mar your life, by so doing you submit to those outward things. Confess that you are their slave, and they your unconditional master. By so doing, you invest them with a power which they do not of themselves possess, and you succumb, in reality not to the circumstances, but to the gloom or gladness fear or hope, the strength of weakness, which your thoughts fear has thrown around them. Nineteenth morning. If you are one of those who are praying for and looking forward to a happier world beyond the grave, here is a message of gladness for you you may enter into and realize that happy world now, it fills the whole universe, and it is within you waiting for you to find, acknowledge, and possess, said one who understood the inner laws of being dash when men shall say, lo here, or lo there, go not after them. The kingdom of God is within you. Nineteenth evening. Heaven and hell are inward states. Sink into self and all its gratifications. And you sink into hell, rise above self into that state of consciousness which is 
the utter denial and forgetfulness of self. And you enter heaven. So long as you persist in selfishly. Seeking for your own personal happiness. So long will happiness elude you, and you. Will be sowing the seeds of wretchedness. In so far as you succeed in losing yourself. In the service of others, in that measure. Will happiness come to you, and you will. Reap a harvest of bliss. Twentieth morning. Sympathy given can never be waste. One aspect of sympathy is that of pity pity for the distressed or pain. Stricken, with a desire to alleviate or help them in their sufferings. The world needs more of this divine quality. For pity makes the world soft to the weak and noble. For the strong. Another form of sympathy is that of rejoicing with others who are more successful than ourselves, and though their success were our own. Twentieth evening. Sweet are companionships, pleasures, and material comforts, but they change and fade away. Sweeter still are purity, wisdom, and the knowledge of truth, and these never change nor fade away. He who attained to the possession of spiritual things can never be deprived of his source of happiness, he will never have to part company with it, and wherever he goes in the whole universe, he will carry his possessions with him. His spiritual end will be the fullness of joy. 21st morning. Let your heart grow and expand with ever broadening love, until, freed from all hatred, and passion, and condemnation, it embraces the whole universe with thoughtful tenderness. As the flower opens its petals to receive the morning light, so open your soul more and more to the glorious light of truth. Soar upward on the wings of aspiration. Be fearless and believe in the loftiest possibilities. Twenty-first evening. Mind clothes itself in garments of its own. Making. Mind is the arbiter of life, it is the creator and shaper of conditions, and the recipient of its own results. It contains within itself both the power to create illusion and to perceive reality. Mind is the infallible weaver of destiny. Thought is the thread, good and evil deeds are the warp and woof, and the web woven upon the loom of life, is character. Make pure thy heart, and thou wilt make thy life rich, sweet, and beautiful, unmarred by strife. Twenty-second morning. Cherish your visions, cherish your ideals. Cherish the music that stirs in your heart the beauty that forms in your mind, the loveliness that drapes your purest thoughts. For out of them will grow all delightful conditions, all heavenly environment. Of these, if you will remain true to them, your world will at last be built. Guard well thy mind, and, noble, strong, and free. Nothing shall harm, disturb or conquer. The for all thy foes are in thy heart and mind. There also thy salvation thou shalt find. Twenty-second evening. Dream lofty dreams, and as you dream. So shall you become. Your vision is the. Promise of what you shall one day be. Your ideal is the prophecy of what you. Shall at last unveil. The greatest achievement was at first. And for a time a dream. The oak sleeps. In the acorn, the bird waits in the egg. And in the highest vision of the soul, a waking angel stirs. Your circumstances may be uncongenial, but they shall not long remain so when you perceive an ideal and strive to reach it. Twenty-third morning. He who has conquered doubt and fear has conquered failure. 
his every thought is. Allied with power, and all difficulties are. Bravely met and wisely overcome. His. Purposes are seasonably planted, and they. Bloom and bring forth fruit which does. Not fall prematurely to the ground. Thought allied fearlessly to purpose. Becomes creative force, he who knows this. Is ready to become something higher and. Stronger than a mere bundle of wavering. Thoughts and fluctuating sensations, he. Who does this has become the conscious. An intelligent wielder of his mental powers. 23rd evening. Man's true place in the cosmos is that of. A king, not a slave, a commander under. The law of good, and not a helpless tool. In the region of evil. I write for men, not for babes, for. Those who are eager to learn, and earnest. To achieve, for those who will put away. For the world's good, a petty personal. Indulgence, a selfish desire, a mean. Thought, and live on as though it were. Not, sans craving and regret. Man is a master. If he were not, he. Could not act contrary to law. Evil and weakness are self-destructive. The universe is girt with goodness. And strength, and it protects the good. And the strong. The angry man is the weak man. Twenty-fourth morning. Not by learning will a man triumph over. Evil, not by much study will he overcome. Sin and sorrow. Only by conquering. Himself will he conquer evil, only by. Practicing righteousness will he put in. Enter sorrow. Not for the clever, nor the learned, nor. The self-confident is the life triumphant. But for the pure, the virtuous and wise. The former achieve their particular success. In life, but the latter alone achieve the. Great success so invincible and complete. That even in apparent defeat it shines with. Added victory. Twenty-fourth evening. The true silence is not merely a silent. Tongue. It is a silent mind. To merely hold. One's tongue, and yet to carry about a. Disturbed and rankling mind, is no remedy. For weakness, and no source of power. Silentness, to be powerful, must. Envelop the whole mind, must permeate. Every chamber of the heart, it must be. The silence of peace. To this broad, deep, abiding silentness. A man attains only in the measure that. He conquers himself. Twenty-fifth morning. By curbing his tongue, a man gains. Possession of his mind. The fool babbles, gossips, argues. And bandies words. He glories in the fact. That he has had the last word, and has. Silenced his opponent. He exults in his own folly, is ever on the defensive, and wastes his energies in unprofitable channels. He is like a gardener who continues to dig and plant in unproductive soil. The wise man avoids idle words, gossips, vain argument, and self-defense. He is content to appear defeated, rejoices when he is defeated, knowing that, having found and removed another error in himself, he has thereby become wiser. Blessed is he who does not strive for the last word. Twenty-fifth evening. Desire is the craving for possession, aspiration. Is the hunger of the heart for peace. The craving for things leads ever farther and farther from peace, and not only ends in deprivation, but is in itself a state of perpetual want. Until it comes to an end, rest and satisfaction are impossible. The hunger for things can never be satisfied, but the hunger for peace can, and the satisfaction of peace is found. 
is fully possessed, when all selfish desire is abandoned. Then there is fullness of joy, abounding plenty, and rich and complete blessedness. 26th morning. A man will reach the kingdom by purifying himself, and he can only do this by pursuing a process of self-examination and self-analysis. The selfishness must be discovered and understood before it can be removed. It is powerless to remove itself, neither will it pass away of itself. Darkness ceases only when light is introduced, so ignorance can only be dispersed by knowledge, selfishness by love. A man must first of all be willing to lose himself, his self-seeking, before he can find himself, his divine self. He must realize that selfishness is not worth clinging to, that it is a master altogether unworthy of his service, and that divine goodness alone is worthy to be enthroned in his heart, as the supreme master of his life. 26th evening. Be still, my soul, and know that peace is thine. Be steadfast, heart, and know that strength divine belongs to thee, cease from thy turmoil. Mind. And thou the everlasting rest shalt find. If a man would have peace, let him exercise the spirit of peace, if he would find love, let him dwell in the spirit of love, if he would escape suffering, let him cease to inflict it, if he would do noble things for humanity, let him cease to do ignoble things for himself, if he will but quarry the mine of his own soul, he shall find there all the materials for building whatsoever he will, and he shall find there also the central rock on which to build in safety. 27th morning. Men go after much company and seek out new excitements, but they are not acquainted with peace, in divers paths of Pleasure they search for happiness, but they do not come to rest, through divers ways of laughter and feverish delirium they wander after gladness and life, but their tears are many and grievous, and they do not escape death, drifting upon the ocean of life in search of selfish indulgences, men are caught in its storms, and only after many Tempests and much privation do they fly to the rock of refuge which rests in the deep silence of their own being. 27th evening. Meditation centered upon divine realities is the very essence and soul of prayer. It is the silent reaching upward of the soul toward the eternal. Meditation is the intense dwelling in thought, upon an idea or theme with the object of thoroughly comprehending it, and whatsoever you constantly meditate upon, you will not only come to understand, but will grow more and more into its likeness, for it will become incorporated with your very being, will become, in fact, your very self. If, therefore, you constantly dwell upon that which is selfish and debasing, you will ultimately become selfish and debased. If you ceaselessly think upon that which is pure and unselfish, you will surely become pure and unselfish. 28th morning. There is no difficulty, however great, but will yield before a calm and powerful concentration of thought, and no legitimate object but may be speedily actualized by the intelligent use and direction of one's soul forces. Whatever your task may be, concentrate your whole mind upon it. Throw into it all the energy of which you are capable. The faultless completion of 
small tasks, leads inevitably to larger tasks. See to it that you rise by steady climbing, and you will never fall. 28th evening. He who knows that love is at the heart of all things, and has realized the all-sufficing power of that love, has no room in his heart for condemnation. If you love people and speak of them with praise, until they in some way thwart you, or do something of which you disapprove, and then you dislike them, and speak of them with dispraise, you are not governed by the love which is of God. If, in your heart, you are continually arraigning and condemning others, selfless love is hidden from you. Train your mind in strong, impartial, and gentle thought, train your heart in purity and compassion, train your tongue to silence and to true and stainless speech. So shall you enter the way of holiness and peace, and shall ultimately realize the immortal love. 29th morning. If you would realize true prosperity, do not settle down, as many have done, into the belief that if you do right, everything will go wrong. Do not allow the word competition to shake your faith in the supremacy of righteousness. I care not what men say about the laws of competition, for do not I know the unchangeable law which shall one day put them all to rout, and which puts them to rout even now in the heart and life of the righteous man? And knowing this law I can contemplate all dishonesty with undisturbed repose, for I know where certain destruction awaits it. Under all circumstances do that which you believe to be right, and trust the law. Trust the divine power which is imminent in the universe, and it will never desert you, and you will always be protected. 29th evening. Forget yourself entirely in the sorrows of others, and in ministering to others, and divine happiness will emancipate you from all sorrow and suffering. Taking the first Step with a good thought, the second with a good word, and the third with a good deed, I entered paradise. And you also enter paradise by pursuing the same course. Lose yourself in the welfare of others. Forget yourself in all that you do this. Is the secret of abounding happiness. Ever be on the watch to guard against selfishness and learn faithfully the divine lessons of inward sacrifice, so shall you climb the highest heights of happiness and shall remain in the never-clouded sunshine of universal joy, clothed in the shining garment of immortality. Thirtieth morning. When the farmer has tilled and dressed his land and put in the seed, he knows that he has done all that he can possibly do, and that now he must trust to the elements, and wait patiently for the course of time to bring about the harvest, and that no amount of expectancy on his part will affect the result. Even so, he who has realized truth goes forth as a sower of the seeds of goodness, purity, love, and peace, without expectancy and never looking for results. Knowing that there is the great over. Ruling law which brings about its own. Harvest in due time, and which is alike the. Source of preservation and destruction. Thirtieth evening. The virtuous put a check upon themselves. And set a watch upon their passions and. Emotions, in this way they gain possession of the mind, and gradually acquire calmness. And as they acquire influence, power, greatness, abiding joy, and fullness and completeness of life, he only finds peace who conquers himself, who strives, day by day, after greater self-possession, 
greater self-control, greater calmness of mind. Where the calm mind is there is strength and rest, there is love and wisdom, there is one who has fought successfully innumerable battles against self, who, after long toil in secret against his own failings, has triumphed at last. Thirty-first morning. Sympathy bestowed increases its store in our own heart and enriches and fructifies our own life. Sympathy given is blessedness. Received, sympathy withheld is blessedness. Forfeited. In the measure that a man increases and enlarges his sympathy so much, nearer does he approach the ideal life, the perfect blessedness, and when his heart has become so mellowed that no hard, bitter, or cruel thought can enter and detract from its permanent sweetness. Then indeed is he richly and divinely blessed. Thirty-first evening. Sweet is the rest and deep the bliss of him who has freed his heart from its lusts and hatreds and dark desires, and he who without any shadow of bitterness resting upon him, and looking out upon the world with boundless compassion and love, can breathe, in his inmost heart, the blessing. Peace unto all living things. Making no exceptions or distinctions. Such a man has reached that happy ending. Which can never be taken away, for this is. The perfection of life, the fullness of peace. The consummation of perfect blessedness.